So throughout this month, we've been reflecting on audacious Anglicans. And today, uh, we will reflect on another audacious Anglican. But it's always first good to remember what audacious means. Old, courageous. And these are particularly individuals who had a very radical faith that left behind an average message. In other words, the average was good enough. And so they wanted, they felt called to something more than the ordinary. Well, let's look at our gospel reading first. And in this particular gospel reading that I just read, we have a couple of examples of how audacious Jesus was in his ministry. So first, Jesus had the audacity, the boldness, to suggest to his disciples that this crowd needed to be fed. They needed to buy food for the crowd, knowing full well that this would present a dilemma. And of course it did, because the disciples said, we don't have enough wages to even go buy food for half this crowd. But also Jesus knew this was a teachable moment. So the second audacious moment in that gospel reading is when he was presented with that meager offering of five barley loaves and two pieces of fish. Five barley loaves and two pieces of fish. And Jesus had the audacity to proceed as if that would just naturally be enough to feed this whole crowd of 5,000 people. Five barley loaves and two pieces of fish. Well, in the midst of people's hesitation, especially his disciples, he took the bread, and he passed the bread around to the crowd. And likewise, he took the fish, and he passed the fish around to the crowd. And out of that audacity, daring to do what seemed the impossible, every single person was fed. And in fact, we're told there were baskets left over, twelve. Five barley loaves and two pieces of fish. And all those people were fed audacity for sure. And then finally, Jesus had the audacity in the midst of a storm to approach the boat where his disciples were in a panic. They were scared senseless because of this storm that had come up on the sea. And there was Jesus having the audacity to walk on the water towards them. And as he did that, he assured them, it's going to be all right, it's me. Don't be afraid. Jesus is definitely an example of what it means to be audacious. He's an inspiration for our calling to be just as audacious in our ministries and in the discipleships that we enter into today. And I think especially as we celebrate this sacrament of baptism, it's a wonderful opportunity to remember that audacious nature of God's calling on each and every one of us and on us together as the church in this place and beyond as well. This morning, the audacious Anglican that we will reflect on is a woman whose name it was Lee Tim Oi. And her story is a fascinating story. And it's an inspiring story. And it's a challenging story. It challenges us today as much as it did in the days when her story began. And it challenges us in our journey to be audacious Anglicans too. So let me tell you about Lee Timoy. She was born in 1907. And the name that she was given, Timoy, means beloved daughter. Now that was done on purpose. And it was done because that is against the negative view of having a daughter in that day and age. She was raised both a Christian and Chinese. She went to primary school until she was 14, which was very unusual for a girl. And then she was denied secondary education in favor of her brothers. They needed to go on in school. 
she didn't. But in her 20s, she resumed her secondary education and she took on the name Florence. And it was after her heroine, Florence Nightingale. So she became Florence Lee Timboy. She attended um, an ordination of a deaconess. Women could be ordained deacons and perform diaconal roles in the life of the church at that time. So this was in 1931. She went to this grand service of ordination of a deaconess, and at that service she sat there and she said to herself, I know I feel called by God. God touched her in some way that she could feel a sense of vocation herself. And so in 1941, 10 years later, she herself was ordained a deacon, and that was to be the end of that part of her vocational story and the living out of that diaconal ministry. She was given charge of an Anglican congregation in the Portuguese colony of Mayakau, and that was made up of mainly refugees from war-torn China. So that's where she was sent to do ministry for the people and for the church. She was described as brave and strong, unwavering, resourceful, and ingenious. Wonderful qualities in a man. In that day and age in a woman? Maybe not. But that was her. Something happened, though, that changed her vocation and took her on a path that she didn't expect and that the church certainly did not expect. Because on January 25th, 1944, Lee Timoy was ordained a priest in the Church of God by Bishop Ronald Hall, making her the first woman to be ordained a priest, 1944. That's significant, because we weren't ordaining women in 1944. And what's also interesting is the, the reason why she was ordained, to fix a pastoral crisis. You see, the place where she was serving, those who were there couldn't receive communion because it was dangerous for the priest to travel from Hong Kong. And so we'll ordain her so she can because she's there already. Right? Makes me laugh too. But imagine how the rest of the communion responded because no one else had been ordaining women to priesthood at that point. She was condemned by two successive archbishops of Canterbury. She was condemned by the Church of England. She was condemned by the Chinese House of Bishops in 1946. And she was condemned by the Land of Conference in 1948. Wow. Archbishop William Temple when he was in private, said this. He said, if we could find any shadow of theological ground for the non-ordination of women, I should be immensely comforted. But such arguments as I have heard on that line seem quite desperately futile. In other words, in private he was saying, I can't see any reason not to ordain women priests. But guess what, he didn't say that publicly. That was in private. This is what he said publicly. I cannot think of any circumstance whatever an individual bishop has a right to take such a step, which is most certainly contrary to all the laws and precedents of the church. I do profoundly deplore the action that you took and have to regard it as ultra virus against your legal authority. That's a pretty powerful statement. There's no doubt publicly where he stood on this. So you can see the conflict that he as a bishop had, because on the one hand he wanted to say, yes, I support this, I see no reason not to, and on the other hand, publicly he said, but I don't see any reason why we should be ordained at that particular time. And so Lee Timoy had her license revoked. She turned her license to be a priest in. But she maintained her priestly status because she was a priest for life. And God had called her to be a priest, not the bishops, not the church. God had called her to be a priest. And it was ultimately God who had ordained her. So what that meant was she couldn't function as a priest 
anymore at that point. And I think, when I think about that, I think that's sad. And not only sad, it's wrong. And it's unjust. But it didn't end there for her. Remember how I described her as bold and courageous? Well, there was ramifications to that. Because during the Communist Revolution in China in 1949, she was suspected because of her boldness of being an imperialist agent and spy. So they re-educated her with back-breaking manual labor. She was immersed in Chinese Marxism and at ideological college. She, she was persecuted even further. Her life was difficult. Her books, her Bible, and her writing, she had done immense writings. They were destroyed by the Red Guards. She lost her health and her eyesight. She was separated from her friends and her family and her congregation. And so she was very lonely and isolated. But never, never, never did she lose her faith. She did not lose her Christian hope. She did not lose her sense of vocation as a priest. And she didn't lose her mind. Well, in 1971, the Anglican Consultative Council, which is a council that looks over the affairs of the whole communion around the world, by a very narrow margin, said that women could be ordained in Hong Kong. 1971. We go to 1974, there were 11 women who were priested in the U.S. Episcopal Church, and in 1976, the Anglican Church of Canada began priesting women. I remember um, the first priestings that happened in St. Catherine's, um, not far, a church not far from my home parish. It was quite an evening. It was quite a night. 1976. That wasn't that long ago. 1977, New Zealand began ordaining women, and I love this phrase when I read it, the nut read it, the 1970s caught up with the 1940s. <laughs> and so Lee Timoy was then restated, reinstated as a priest in the Anglican communion. Imagine how she felt at that moment. Imagine. Now there are connections um, here in the Diocese of Toronto with Florence B. Timoy. She moved to Toronto in 1983 and became the honorary assistant at St. John's Chinese and St. Matthew's churches. St. John's Chinese church is still in Willowdale um, to this day. And until her death in 1992, she exercised her priesthood with faithfulness and with a quiet dignity and humility and increased the support for other women seeking ordination. She got um, doctorates of divinity by theological, uh, General Theological Seminary in New York and Trinity College here in Toronto. And this is significant. General Synod of the Anglican Church of Canada in 2004 passed a resolution that this General Synod authorized the inclusion of the Reverend Florence Lee Tim Oy as a memorial in the Book of Alternative Services calendar of holy persons. And so she would be rem remembered every year on February 26th, the date of her death. Well, we might ask, so why is her audacious example relevant to us today? Why is it important for us to remember her? I saw a picture a few years ago, a photograph, that was taken of Bishop Linda Nichols, um, Reverend Ken and Heather McCants, and two other female priests, and they were in China um, on some work that the communion was involved in. And the significance of that photo of them in China was they were standing at the altar where Li Timoy first celebrated the Eucharist. So imagine these, I think there were four or five women, standing at the altar where the first female priest in 1944 had been allowed and given provision to celebrate the Eucharist. This must have been a very powerful moment um, for them. For women like Patty, for women like Margaret, Lee Timoy's example is extremely important. 
for bishops like Priscilla and Jenny and Bishop Linda Nichols and other bishops too. Lee Tamoy was the way forward to ordain women around the communion. And you might be surprised, you might not be surprised, but you might be surprised there are still countries and parts of our communion that do not ordain women to the priesthood. Central Africa, Nigeria, others that don't make that provision for the ordination of female bishops. Something that we take for granted in our Canadian context. Well, I give thanks for my female colleagues in ministry that I have the privilege of working alongside of. I give thanks for the gifts they bring to the church, for their vocations, um, which for too long in our church's history were trivialized and not validated as authentic from God. Talk about audacity. Those who were brave, those who were courageous, those who were committed to their calling, who faced the struggles along the way, the barriers in front of them, so they could be faithful. Definitely audacious and bold and courageous. Well, this morning we are going to baptize two children and one adult. As parents, and Stephen, for you as yourself, you are making a choice. You are making an audacious, bold, courageous choice. As we welcome you into the body of Christ, and as you make promises and a covenant with God. This is audacious on your part. Especially in the world we live in today, you are making an audacious statement of faith. You are standing up and you are saying, even though the world out there is the way it is, this is what I believe in, the hope and the promise of the gospel through Jesus Christ. And that I will live out that gospel as a faithful follower and disciple of Jesus Christ. That's an audacious claim to make in the world we live in today. And the rest of us, we will renew our baptismal covenants. We will remember our discipleship that we have entered into. As one, we will say, this is what we believe in. And that with the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us, that we will do what we can to live out that audacious faith. We will work for justice and peace among all people. We will respect the dignity of every human being. We will strive to safeguard the integrity of God's creation. But notice the response, I will give God's help because on our own, we may feel audacious, but it's only with the help of the Holy Spirit that we can truly be that audacious presence in the world. Those are audacious promises to make. Those are audacious promises to strive to keep as we live our lives day to day. But with the audacity of individuals like Florence Lee Timor, and following the audacity of Jesus himself, we can be faithful in our disciples. We can be faithful in living out our audacious faith. And we pray that these three new members of the body of Christ, the church, will do so also. Let's pray. Loving God, giver of all good gifts, fill us with your grace. That we, like your audacious servant, Timoy, the first woman to be ordained an Anglican priest, may entrust you with our destiny. May we with her same forbearance in the face of adversity always witness to you in all things. Through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.